I always do wow. So give me a round. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Warm welcome. Very nice to have you here. Warm welcome back again for those who have been here already. Welcome to those who are coming for the first time to Berlinale Talents. It's a pleasure to have you here at the Hau Hebel am Ufer. As you know, we have a lot of people coming in and out over the course of these days. And it's always special. It's always a big moment also for us. And uh, I'm happy to share this special moment with you in a minute. And for us, as you know, Berlinale Talents, that's so many different fields of work. It includes, uh, we always say it's the production table uh, that comes together. So you're discussing with cinematographers, you're discussing with editors, you're discussing with production designers, you name it. And this exchange is very important to us and we would like to continue this, uh, this exchange today also here on stage and with you, especially because you're coming from all these different angles probably. And we would love to do it with uh, two people who are very important to us, very precious to us. And in order to introduce them to you, I would like to introduce you to the moderator of the session, which is Vinka Wiedemann. Thank you. Hello. Wow. This room is so beautiful. Hello, everybody. And a lot of people up there and... Uh, we want to, you know, we want to interact with you, but it's a bit difficult to see you. So hopefully we can uh, make it anyway. So a lot of people here and, um, well, I'm Vinka Wiedemann. I'm an old time friend of the film festival and uh, also a director of the National Film School of Denmark. But I have a long background in uh, filmmaking as a film editor and producer, script writer, commissioning editor and so on. So, uh, um, I have been looking forward to be here, but I've been looking forward extra much to be with the talent, uh, with the talent people, because I believe we always have so great discussions and such a freely and open debate. And uh, and uh, I believe that today we have a really great uh, starting point for making a good discussion because. Um, I will sit down because uh, I will. Uh, uh, today we have uh, two great women uh, with us, and I will introduce them to you now. The first one is Agnes Godard. Agnes, come on stage. Come and sit. You sit here. And. And uh, it's such an honor to, to, to get to introduce you. You, are, you have worked with some of the greatest uh, directors we have in Europe. You have such a distinct voice, or maybe I should say I, uh, and, uh, and you, uh, you have such an authority in your cinematography. And uh, you also uh, won some very prestigious awards. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and about how it came about. But first of all, I would like also to introduce you Nancy Schreiber. Nancy, come on stage. <laughs> and I mean, uh, Nancy is a legendary, not just because she did a, a lot of fantastic cinematographic work, but also because, uh, you know, I, I read about you that you were the first one, the first woman ever to enter the kind of GAFA association or something like that, and you were the f only the fourth woman to enter the ASC, uh, so, and you were one of the founders of the Women in fil Film in New York, you were in the foundation board, so you have uh, had a a long history uh, and you have a fantastic career and uh, so before I start asking questions and and I know I will only have to ask a few questions because you want to get to know each other and I'll give the, you the chance to do that but f firstly I just want to tell you that we're going to open up uh, for questions a bit later and we would love also to have questions 
now and then. So start thinking of your questions. If you only had one question, or if you only had one comment, or if you only had one statement that you want to come up with today, what would it be? Because later on, you'll get the chance, okay? And, uh, and if you become impatient, do like this, and I will do the best to try and see you, and we have microphones all over this so we can come with them to you. Okay, so uh, Nancy, I will begin with you. So, uh, and, and, I, and I'm sorry, I will be very banal. I will begin with the beginning. So when, when was it that you realized that uh, you had something going on with images and with visuals? How did it, how did it begin? Well, I had been shooting stills a lot when I was in particular in college, uh, although I got a psychology degree. And uh, when I decided to go into the film business, I think my parents were very upset that I wasn't going to be having a real career and that I was going to be a freelancer. But I was always interested in imagery. Um, my mom was an art dealer. I went to museums since I was five. Um, and I was actually a, a summer exchange student in Holland when I was in high school. And I remember just living in the museums in Amsterdam. So I had an art background, but somehow I didn't pursue it in college. And then uh, I moved to New York and answered an ad in the Village Voice, which is like the underground <laughs> paper. And I got on a movie. and was very small, and uh, there was only one person, one gaffer in the whole electric department, and I ended up there, and uh, I realized lighting was where it was at. So somehow um, this gaffer taught me so much, and uh, uh, I just continued for many years as an electrician and a gaffer in New York. If I had been in Los Angeles, I don't know if I'd still be sitting here today. But. That's how I started. <laughs> and and yes, what about you? Is it was it also? Uh, I know that you had an education as a journalist, I believe. Yes, but this is only because uh, when I told my parents that I wanted to work on movies, they said no question about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go around, you know, to make a little travel in a circle before to reach the uh, cinema school. But uh, I was attracted since I was a little child by uh, pictures and photography because my father used to do a lot of family pictures and film pictures. And um, he died very young, a long, long time ago. And uh, I discovered through the uh, family pictures and film that uh, it was uh, somehow the words he never said. So, I thought definitely we can say a lot of things with pictures, so I decided I wanted to do that. And that's how I was attracted to it. Mm. And uh, so I, um, yeah, I studied uh, six years and then started to work as a journalist, but then uh, quit and uh, went into the cinema school and uh, chose to work on images. So uh, did you go to school as a cinematographer? When you went to, not La Famille, but the French, the French film school back then. Yeah, at that time it was called Institut des Hautes Études Cinématographiques, which is uh, now famous. It was rather a, I would say, um, a school to, for people who wanted to be a director. Mm -hmm. But then still there was this uh, possibility, second year, to choose either editing, either picture. I chose this school, I don't know why, I was attracted by this school because it seemed to me that it was complete to learn to go through to, uh, you know, all the, the, the different steps, different, uh, um, how do you do a film? Mm. And to, to participate to all the uh, state of the, uh, of the fabrication of a film. So. And I was very happy about that. And that's how I met, uh, that's where I met briefly Henri Alcan, mm. who was a, a, 
they're a great DP. And uh, because uh, I was supposed to do the light on a film of uh, a student of my uh, year, my course, at the end of the study. And uh, Henri was there with us for two days as a teacher. And so I was beside him. And a few months after, when I finished school, he gave me a phone call and said, you know, I'm going to leave to Portugal. I'm going to work with a guy. This guy's name is Wim Wenders. <laughs> Do you know him? <laughs> and I said, yes or no, but uh, would you like to come with me? And uh, uh, I said, yeah, but I come because I haven't done anything. And he said, don't worry. I'm the only one who know that. I know you can come with me. And that's, it was like a fairy tale. Can you imagine? And that's how I started to be a focus puller on state of things. And it was, uh, it was a fairy tale. <laughs> but um, fairy tale, but it was a, a great um, privilege to be watch him because he was a, such a great technician, but also, how do you say, um, artisan? Mm. Uh, Artistic? Yeah. No? Uh, yeah. No. He had these both qualities, which was uh, incredible, very inventive. So, so you had your maybe your big chance because you went to film school and and you were in an environment where someone saw you and gave you a chance. Is that so? So, and you didn't go to film school, Nancy. You didn't have that chance. So, how did you go about it? Oh. I think I just didn't know any better, and I, th I thought I could just do it. I, you know, there weren't. There was one other woman who was a gaffer, and uh, I worked on a lot of uh, commercials and independent movies, and a few documentaries. And uh, one documentarian, a director cameraman named uh, Mark Obenhaus had given me an opportunity to light a commercial for Bob Fosse. Um, Mark was directing, basically, and you know Bob was there, uh, but Mark didn't have a lighting background, so I got to light this whole beautiful dance sequence. Uh, it was Pippin, was the Bob Fosse um, Broadway show. And uh, when dailies happened, I didn't get invited. And Mark said, Nancy, you have to go sh start shooting. And he loaned me his 16 millimeter camera and uh, a gaffer friend loaned me lights. And I just started shooting independent, mostly student films at Columbia University because they didn't have a cinematography department like New York, New York University did. So uh, that's how I got started, but then the work in the United States for the few women shooting was in documentaries. And I had no background in shooting handheld uh, because I came out of lighting. And uh, I bought a camera and I made my own documentary just to show that I could shoot handheld. And of course now the trend in television and movies is so much handheld. and. Uh, yeah, um, I sort of clawed my way back from documentaries into the dramatic realm, and yet I really like shooting both genres. Uh, there's nothing like real life to inspire our fiction work. Yeah. But so you say the few women that were they were in documentary. Why do you think it was? What, what did it? Was it this? The usual thing about the small, intimate stuff, and yeah. as opposed to the going into war. No, I don't think it was the small, intimate. It was that it's very much based on money, <laughs> and I see it today. Uh, even though documentaries, there's like a small crew, and we're doing all the work, and it's actually harder in some ways than shooting narrative. Um, the women were sort of delegated to. The, this world, because there wasn't as much money involved, I think, no, you know, in power, and uh, I certainly see that today. Uh, that many of the women directors in the states and cinematographers are relegated to the independent cinema. Now, I happen to like shooting independent films, and here we are, the Brill and Alley, but um, it's uh, still a question of power and money. 
and uh, I'm very fortunate that I did work with um, some wonderful documentarians over the years and continue to. So, uh, so just a little small additional question to to that is that that you uh, how did you break through from documentary to fiction then? Because it's like we very often have this glass roof, the invisible roof of how can you, how can you advance? So who, who gave you the chance or how did you make the chance come? Hmm. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I remember shooting uh, in January in northern Wisconsin, which is a very cold place, uh, and it was a horror film. You know, we took what we could get. But it was a wonderful director, and uh, the um, production designer had been the art director on Room with a View, um, Merchant Ivory, and I thought, well, I'm sure the sets will be great. So I went and did that, and then one thing led to another, and I got to work on a wonderful film uh, with an Argentinian director, Temi Lopez, on Chain of Desire, and these were tiny movies under one million, but still shot in those days in 35 millimeter. Um, and you know, one thing led to another, and I just was persistent and didn't want to take no for an answer. And uh, even though uh, in those days there was there was no website, uh, we had three quarter cassette reels, and my agent at the time had uh, sent some reels out to try to get some work for me and noticed that when he put my initials, N.J. Schreiber, he put a little tab in the cassette, they viewed it, but if he put Nancy Schreiber, they did, the cassette came back with the tab still there. So it was rough, but um, I kept going, you know, we're here today. We do. <laughs> yeah, <woo. laughs> yes, and and you know, and if you Google Agnes, uh, it's of course a very different story. But yet, I believe there's a little bit of the same because I I read it says in in uh, in Wikipedia it says. Goudard spent much of the 1980s working as an assistant camera operator or focus puller on films by Wenders, Joseph Lucy, Peter Greenaway, and Alain René. So, I mean, really uh, nice names and uh, working as a focus puller and an assistant camera operator. So, we talked a little bit about it backstage before the when was the first time that you actually was given the credit as a cinematographer? Your first, your first film where you kind of had your breakthrough. Yeah, it was uh, actually kind of a documentary. It was a f film made by Wim Wenders from 666, and that was a um, interviews of a director that were presenting their film at Cannes Festival, and uh, it was uh, shot in a room, hotel, room 666 in the Hotel Martinez in Cannes. And they were supposed to answer one question, cinema, is it an art about to die? <laughs> 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 and uh, so we were two of them as a crew, uh, the sound guy and me, and uh, this positive was very uh, simple. There was a 16 camera and uh, set somewhere with uh, two lights and um, and we and the uh, sound guy would set the microphone on them and we would have to leave them to show them where to push the button on and off <laughs> and to to let them answer alone that that question that's <laughs> it was incredible but it was really an Fascinating, we could hear, and uh, yes, it was incredible. Yes. And uh, then after, um, I worked with uh, Claire Denis also on a documentary about Jacques Rivette. Mm. It was supposed to be a one-hour film for TV, 
And then it was so full, so rich, it became a two hours film. <laughs> and um, and uh, then uh, that's how I started to work as a cam camera operator. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then finally with her also, no, with uh, Peter Hanke as a DOP, mm -hmm. uh, partly produced by Wim Wenders. That's so um, so then you gradually then you then you got through to filmmaking to filmmaking as a DOP. Yeah. And I think that we should see an early example of a clip from an early example of your work with uh, Claire Denis, a very, very beautiful film clip of uh, of Boutravail. Okay. So let's roll the first film clip, please. So, you must tell us a little bit about this uh, fantastic piece of art. We just so we have to say it was a few clips, and you selected them in order to have something without dialogue, huh? Yeah. So, what was it? What can you tell us about the collaboration on this f film? Um, it was a. Um kind of a low budget film. It was, um, we had to choose whether we would shoot uh, Super 16 or 35. I decided while being in Paris that probably 35 would be much better. That was my point of view. But because of the budget, everybody thought we should shoot um, Super 16. Then we decided to go on scouting there. So I, 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 I went there with a, a body of camera, one lens, a few pieces of uh, emulsions to, 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 to make some images because I wanted to choose uh, either Kodak or Fuji or wanted to find. And then um, that's how on the way back, we, everybody realized that because we were going to do this film very simply uh, with a few tools, 35 would be better. Then it was, of course, also the, all the talent of uh, Claire Denis, because um, you know we had a uh, few tools, but we had big tools. It was this uh, deserted landscapes, sky, sea, um, hair, rocks, and men bodies, bodies in the landscape. So I think. What we try to do is uh, to make a film as organic as possible with what was there. It was extremely spiritual. I really remember once we went to see um, the border with Ethiopia because we were about to, we were thinking about shooting there. It's incredible. When you arrive there, you don't know if it's beginning of the uh, of the earth, of the world, or end of the world. So. It was extremely inspiring. Then we could not shoot in this area because it was too far away. But then it was a mise en condition, if I may say so, that was really uh, fantastic. And um, there is also, strangely, another factor that was uh, very uh, uh, strong and uh, played as an emulsion, <laughs> emulation. <laughs> it's we never saw no one image while we were shooting there. We were all blind, we did that blind. And somehow, I think, because of that, maybe we felt free, free to try. Try and try and try even further, to go further each time. And uh, I think that's why we were so, I don't know, <laughs> we just there to go. Um, Do you think it, it would have been different if, like today, you see the you see immediately what you've done? You go to the monitor and you review. Were you more daring because you you didn't see the the rushes? Yes, for instance, I, I remember now that um, may, the film has been shot mainly with a 50 millimeter lens, but also 100, even handheld. All what we saw is handheld camera. 
it was a bit, uh, at the beginning, a little bit difficult because uh, as the guys were running, I was running with the camera, it was like very hot, 45 degrees, 48 degrees. So it was, uh, but then it was giving, that's what I was saying through the viewfinder, the most simple image, images, N very kind of primitive, you know, it's like when you see, you see a face, so you see the face, and then after half of a second, it says, it tells you something. And that's where cinematography is so rich sometimes and uh, is part of the storytelling. And uh, I think that's what we experience uh, a lot. And um, for instance, for the, what we call the, the dance of the eye, <laughs> because they, we, we were supposed to do only the white shot, white shot and then wh while doing it, I said, I want to come closer, and uh, I came closer. And sometimes we had the music on the set. That's why people were looking at us sometimes with a very strange, you know, they thought they are totally crazy. What are they doing? But it was really, um, I don't know, everybody was uh, kind of uh, dancing, choreography, the, the, the film somehow. and. Uh, and that's it. But I think we, we try to do, we were, the, this, the style, if I may say so, of the images you just saw was not prepared. We arrived there because we worked with what we had there mm -hmm. on set and as tools and on everything. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's the result of a, of a collaboration and a, so that's why it's so, it was so exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's so great. Do you think it's also, it's, it's just funny because it's a story about the, uh, what do you call the foreign legion? So it's about soldiers, it's about very strict people living with very strict rules and, being, and punishments and all kind of things. And, uh, and I think, believe it's inspired by uh, uh, Billy Butt by Melville. So, and, and then you come, is this, maybe I'm exaggerating or projecting, then you must tell me, but it's like, so you have this very male story with uh, depicting a society with, with very strict structures, and you come in, a uh, female director, female cinematographer, and just feel <laughs> what it's like, and have this very organic attitude. And I, be I believe when I see it that this clash gives some of the magic. Is this something you can recognize, or is it just me reading something into the film? No, probably you, you're right. I never thought exactly about that because it's true that it's a very, very free adaptation of uh, Herman Melville's Billy Bird and the music is uh, uh, Billy Bird, uh, mm -hmm. Benjamin Britten, the opera. Um, and the guys had um, trained for one month or one month and a half in Paris you know, to, to experience, to, to see how to dance, to, to choreograph what could be military mm. uh, exercises. Mm. And um, we watched them and I don't know, maybe um, they, these legionnaires, they are playing war. Mm. They are pretending training for mm. war. They are pretending it's war but it's fake, it's fiction. And I think that's what relates the things. So somehow maybe did not really matter that we were women or not. It was a fiction, it was a film, it was a subject of a film. And uh, the point towards we were going. Hmm. So Nancy, this is, I, I, I believe you would agree with me saying that this is a very European way we, we talked about is there a difference between the European way and the US way of making film and shooting. So uh, would you consider this a European way of doing things? <laughs> oh, I was, I think it's so exciting. I mean, I was just thinking about how, we, you know, you pulled focus and the whip hands and like, it's just beautiful and seamless and so modern today, you know, like 
I just love seeing it again. It's been a long time. And I don't know that it's U European necessarily, um, but I know you were asking before about the female question, and it's, you know, you're shooting soldiers, and I think of Catherine Bigelow shooting Hurt Locker, and, you know, there's, I don't believe that there has to be a female voice in terms of what our subject matter or our interests are or how we shoot. I just found that so engaging. Um, I was very excited by seeing this footage, and uh, it was just so dynamic. And um, I don't see male or female. I just see Agnes, your great work. It's fantastic. And seamless editing, obviously. I mean, it was fantastic. And when the camera later was put on the tripod and it got calm with the water, you know, it was just, it took me to another place. So I was feeling very emotional, emotionally attached to what was going to happen next. I was really um, on edge at the beginning, you know, so, and then it got calm. It was beautiful, just beautiful. I don't know if it's European, but it's certainly, uh, daring and uh, you know today I don't think uh, I mean ev today the, everybody's doing cut 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 and it was so great to see this you know held shots and I see your work without it being edited so you know it was really exciting but I, so now uh, I would like to contrast this clip mm -hmm. with a, a, a completely different uh, clip, uh, a film uh, that you shot called uh, Shadow Magic. And, uh, and it was, we, we tried to compose this line of clips. We have four clips so that uh, it will be really not the same as before. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, we're going to show you something completely different, and I believe this is also a collection of a few clips. So, uh, so let's have a look at it, and then you can tell about it afterwards. So, uh, this film was actually shot about 19 years ago, I can't believe it. You can tell it's standard death, so it kind of funky. But it was 35 millimeter. Um, it was an interesting co-production, including with Germany and China. Um, the director, a woman, Anne Hu, she had been in um, the Red Army. Uh, his, her parents were sent away. Uh, they were intellectuals um, during the Cultural Revolution. Anyway, she managed to come to the United States in the 80s and met her husband also from China, and they became wildly successful stockbrokers, capitalists, you know, so she left her communist background. Anyway, she just always wanted to make films, and Sandra Schulberg, maybe some of you know, um, found the money, it was a very low budget. Um, and so Anne and Sandra and I went uh, with Jared Harris, a British actor, and I took one crew member. And back then, um, well, not many people spoke English. And it was very interesting because the only thing that was the same were the numbers. So I would look and make sure that the film stock was like the right stock being loaded and the filters. And uh, I remember uh, they would, Sandra came to Germany to try to get more money and they wouldn't let her back in. So I would have to hand out the call sheets to Jared, which would be a slip of paper with the scene numbers, just the numbers. And it was really basic. Uh, we had a hard time with translators because we weren't paying very much. and. Uh, so they kept leaving to get better jobs <laughs> wherever their English was, uh, was needed. Um, also, we sent the film, 35 millimeter, back to New York, and we never got to see dailies 
until the, like, the last day we were leaving. It was also very different. It was cold. It was December in Beijing. And uh, there's a little bit in the Forbidden City, and they made us go in. We only had from like 7 in the morning when it just got light until 7.45 because then the tourists started to come and we were doing you know, a period film. And there wasn't a lot left in China, in Beijing that was old. They had really knocked a lot down. So it was challenging. Um, and uh, uh, I, I wonder now, and thinking about it, you know, a woman director, woman cinematographer, I know that um, I have a few friends who have come to the States, women from China, and they're having a rough time even now being cinematographers. So maybe we um, surprise some people, but um, the crew was respectful and I operated. Oh, that's the other thing, you know, I didn't know a word of Chinese, but I could tell Anne if I thought a performance wasn't true. I would pull her aside and say, you know, let's take another one. Because language was not a part of this equation. I was just looking at the faces. And so, because I didn't, I just was looking at the emotion. Uh, I could tell if a performance was good or not. <laughs> it was very interesting <laughs> to see. But but you told, uh, I read somewhere that you said that uh, one of the things that surprised you about becoming a cinematographer was that uh, part of it was di so different from what you had thought. You had thought it would all be about being an artist, mm -hmm. and you realized how much it takes also m managing skills, and you need to the authority becoming. I mean, a head of department and controlling. I mean, this must have taken. I mean, it really it takes a woman to uh, to be controlling that uh, amount of extras, and I don't know. So, how did you did you ever did you ever go to any managing courses, or how did you do it? How do you do it? No, I. You know, if you, I mean, I came up in the system, so. I was an electrician and a gaffer, and so I mean, I really understood crew. And um, so I, I don't know if that's part of it, but you know, with cinematographers, if it's a dr large dramatic production, we run three departments, camera, grip, and electric. Um, and you know, it's really interesting if you're respected and that you show that you know what you're doing, you won't have a problem, generally. Uh, and hopefully your crew, hand-picked often, uh, respects you and wants to partner with you. And, uh, uh, but it's also being on time and on budget that we, we work with our crew that are our contemporaries and then we have to answer to the powers that be with the money and the schedule. And uh, when I started, um, like for example, Chain of Desire, the uh, Argentinian director, who I think we had 30 days, and now I'm shooting films in 18 days. You know, there's just no time. And the schedules are crazy. And um, I'm shooting the page count. I mean, that to me, I feel like in Europe, you still have a respect for filmmaking, independent filmmaking, and you know, you're given enough time. At least this is my opinion. I don't know if that's true, but you know, it's, uh, shrinks. it shrinks. Okay, well, and you know, I have to say that so much of the work now in the US is television. And because I am able to shoot such high page, page count, I can work in television. They know I can do it. I mean, that's we all go back and forth now, but it's a sad state of affairs with independent cinema because uh, the middle budget range of budgets aren't being made anymore. They're tiny, tiny, and I am doing the tiniest budgets again. Uh, but since I love directors' visions. 
I will still shoot them and yeah. I'll make it work in 15 days or 17 days, whatever. It's crazy. And, you know, they're all the same amount of time. I mean, that's what's also interesting about the Hollywood system and how hard it's been for women directors, for women cinematographers. One would think that if you have 60 days or longer and lots of money, why should that be harder? Why should you be cut out of that world when you're making 16 or 17 day films that under a million dollars? You know, it just never made sense. But anyway, hopefully it's changing. So Agnes, what is... Yeah. <laughs> so this is about being a head of a team and head of a department and like Nancy talks about, how did you experience it and did it develop over years? I mean, having the authority, all the things you have to do with being in command. How, how was it for you? How natural was it for you and did it develop? No, but in fact, I, I was uh, like you, Nancy. I, I, I wanted to to be director of photography. I did not even know the the name, but um, I, I had no idea that you that means you have a crew. You have to um, govern a crew somehow. And uh, and uh, but I discovered that's a very uh, important part. And. Uh, and um, because you are not doing this work alone, you really share the work and the result with your crew. And uh, especially for me, then what one person who's very excessively important is the gaffer. And uh, as a matter of fact, I remember I asked once Henri Alcourt to be in his electric department in one film, and he said, no, no. <laughs> but uh, it's um, it's excessively important, and uh, and it's, it's true that it's where you learn how to organize your work, how to find ideas, how to share ideas, advices, how it's an emulation too, uh, how it's so important to. To, to, to be confident in people around you and how it helps you also to be free, to be near the director, to be, uh, you know, you know that people are working, understood what you wanted, what you were searching. They would even search for you. That's so precious. And then you could keep on uh, hearing the director telling uh, what he says, sometimes it's difficult to say exactly what you want. So you have to guess, so you have to spend time. So uh, at least when they say what they don't want, <laughs> it's, it's a door open and then you can propose and then you go and see your crew. It's, uh, and that's where you learn what is collaboration. And collaboration is the most important word on the set and on making movies. That's what I think. Mm. Did, you, did you want to add something? Oh. Uh, yes, without crew, we are nothing. Uh, no, it's, uh, we're just so lucky to be able to work in an art form where we can work with people, you know, we're not as much as sometimes I'd love to be a painter or sculptor, uh, I think I'd be really lonely. And uh, you know, there's just something so exciting about having this family together. Hopefully, they're not too dysfunctional, a family. Um, but I can run into people from 20 years ago or 15 or 10 years ago, and you just have this bond that's so exciting, and you just pick up where you left off. And um, you know, I'm not always lucky enough to work with the same crew um, over and over again. Uh, also, because we're filming in such diverse places now um, in the states, 
we film where the tax incentives are. New York has them. Los Angeles, California did not have them all the years that Schwarzenegger was governor. His own business, go figure. But so many people left California and moved to Atlanta, Georgia, or wherever. So we're everywhere in the world now, um, in the states, and we can't bring our crew. So we have to make friends very quickly with new crew. And so you know, I I miss the being able to take the same people over and over again. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's you know amazing to have these relationships all over mm -hmm. that, you know, so I've got probably more friends now than I would have from all over. But it's funny you should say sculpt sculpturing because you once said that you would uh, compare uh, film not to photography and not to painting but to sculpturing. Mm -hmm. And I think we should see the next clip uh, of yours, and uh, because it also definitely have sculptural qualities, I believe. So let's roll the next clip, which is uh, Golden Door. So, uh, oh, you know, it's really moving to see, and and uh, and I think it's a fantastic movement, sculptural movement, also from this very big picture with all these people and then ending in the scene with this very close image of the woman. So so we've talked a little bit about the relation to the crew now and, and maybe this could be a starting point for you to say something about working with actors as a cinematographer. Yeah, so this film uh, was shot in Argentina, Buenos Aires, in Sicilia. It's a period film relating the uh, immigration trip from Sicilia to New York. We could not uh, shoot in Ellis Island. It was shot in 2005, it was too complicated. And so we shot in Argentina because there is a big harbor, also immigration hotel, and because it has been also a big place for immigration at the beginning of the 20th century. Particularity of this film is there is always a lot of people in the frame. And uh, Emanuele Crialese wanted to, to have all of them all the time. Because, of course, we had a script, of course, we had, but I think it was really right because the most empire, inspiring material, if I may say so, were the people, the faces, and the, we were shooting in a natural location, in studio, in the natural location, all transformed, you know, all kind of things. And, um, and it's true that having them all the time, being with them, near them, was totally inspiring because they were so beautiful, they were alive, they were, I don't know, it's... Um, um, yeah, I, I, I can't say any how else. And um, it was so uh, inspiring that uh, um, sometimes uh, shots were invented with them. So we were a little bit uh, improvising on the set and, um, and um, it's true that Human faces, faces are so mysterious. But this, this scene in the bath, in the showers, so I, I think that what's so extraordinary about it is not just the composition or the lightning, but the, the fact that it seems like they're, uh, not that you're not there as a cinematographer, but that it feels like they are feeling comfortable with the fact that you are there. Huh. Um, Again, it may be a projection, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you see, funny, maybe I go, I'm going to join Nancy, and when she was saying that uh, working with a Chinese crew was uh, complicated because no language. 
on the film they were speaking Italian, but not really Italian. It was like a kind of a Sicilian slang or something, so no possibility to, to communicate. But finally, by, by being there all the time, close by, nearby, watching everybody, it's like we knew each other all the time. And uh, for instance, in studio, to break down the idea of the studio, sometimes we were, most of the time, shooting on held. So I would go in between them and keep the other eye open. And the, so it's incredible because by looking at each other, we kind of knew each other. So maybe that's what you, what you feel. And, the, and the, there was so, so big diversity of uh, faces and plus the really uh, amazing work of the uh, um, costume department from coming from Italy. It was really incredible. I don't know, it was like uh, we knew each other. And I remember one day, we were um, filming uh, only a woman uh, in their um, dormitory, as they say. And um, I was attracted by a woman because she was sad and she was uh, beginning to cry and I walked towards her with the camera. And then after that, when we cut, she came to me and this time we could speak a little bit and she explained to me that she arrived in uh, Argentina when she was a little girl. And as when they were, um, during the, the travel, women would be on one side and men on another side. And she said that so she was with her mother and uh, um, when they arrived in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, they never saw the father anymore. Mm. They didn't know, they never knew if he, he died during the travel or if he, you know, escaped. And uh, she was uh, remembering that it's, but you see, she was alone in, there were 90 person. It's incredible how you can uh, feel a mm. thing in a, in a crowd. So. Maybe that's what you're saying. <laughs> well, yeah, so I, I remember being uh, in Denmark in the late 90s and working with a historic film. And uh, now Denmark is a very homogenous society. Uh, everyone is very much alike and uh, comparably, at least to, if you compare with other countries. And someone told, asked me, so why a journalist asked me, so why would we look at a historic film because they're not, it's not like us? And I believe that you just gave the answer, the two of you, because it's the diversity that actually creates all the curiosity, and why shouldn't we be curious? So I, I think we just saw some two really great examples of that. Uh, and, and with this uh, diversity uh, note, and before we we, have, so we still have one great clip to go, and, and, but I think we will finish up with that. I, uh, I know that time is running, and, uh, and uh, I promised all of us that we would uh, open up the floor for questions. So I still have a lot of questions, but, uh, but now I will uh, open up the floor for questions. So uh, please raise your hand, and, uh, and let's... And let's get going. Yes, one over there. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for being here tonight and talking to us and um, about the industry. Um, my question is, you both briefly talked about the industry becoming more and more open for women. And I was wondering if it's only a posit positive change going on or if there are also, I mean, m maybe negative um, ways the industry change for women and also for other minority, minorities, uh, people of color, etc. Well, I think that's uh, positive going on, really. Um, it's, uh, it's changing, maybe slowly, but our resistance is working. Resistance takes time, but it's, it's working. I really, uh, I really think so. And, um, um, yeah, do you? Um, yesterday I was 
lucky enough to get together with some of you out there, Cinematographers XX in Germany, and there are cinematographers all over the world now forming organizations to show now that there is internet, that we have a body of work, that there are so many women. Uh, I know that uh, a director, uh, a woman I've worked with last year was on a panel and one a producer there said, oh, I don't know any women cinematographers. And you know, she was able to give the websites and say, look at there's 50 of them here in Germany, and uh, we, there are hundreds all over the world. So things are definitely opening up. Um, I also try to have women in electric and grip departments on my crew, and uh, I was fortunate enough this past summer on uh, Maplethorpe, a dramatic film that has not come out yet, to have an all-female camera crew. So, you know, we try. Uh, um, and I have a film I'm about to shoot. I have an African-American woman operator. Um, and it's happening. It's happening. And they, people just need to give us a chance. And we will do better than one could ever imagine because we, work, we have to work hard and we can't, we're not allowed to make mistakes, right? That's the <laughs> other problem. But um, I don't think there's a backlash yet. Um, I mean, we're having some issues in our country, but um, there's a lot going on. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there are a lot of movements, and we're hopeful that this time, maybe change can happen. But can I ask, can I ask how many female, the, any female cinematographers here, please raise your hand. Yes, wow, great. <laughs> That's, no, and keep the microphone because I want to ask you a question. Is that okay? So, do you think there's a backlash? Do you think everything is going the right way, or what? no? I was just, I was wondering because, like you said, um, there are some political movements that I mean they frighten me certainly, and uh, like in the German Parliament, for example, I think it's now lower than 30% female in the parliament. And it's just, you know, it, when it happens in, in the political system, it also happens sometimes to the society. And I was wondering because, I mean, let's talk a different genre. Let's talk uh, superhero, superhero movies. The both biggest superhero movies, Black Panther and Wonder Woman, uh, both featuring either minority black people or women and a female, female director. So there are certainly big movies, big, productions, you know, based around these um, people. But I was just wondering if we're only talking the positive impact and the positive movement, is there also some things that are going wrong? So I was just wondering because of that, so mm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad if it's just a positive change. Well, we hope so, and now yeah. there's another one um, that is being faced in Hollywood, both for men and women, which is ageism. So there's always something. And uh, <laughs> we just have to, uh, if you're, we're really dedicated to what we do, we'll find a way to survive. And hopefully, in America, our voices will be heard. I mean, there's just so much going on, with the gun violence. And it's, you know, I was in Europe when I was pretty young, traveling around and it was during the Vietnam War, and I was very ashamed. And here I am again, and you know, it's very shameful um, about so many areas, um, but we all have to just live our own lives and be political and vocal and take action and not uh, sit around and hope others, others will do it. So we have to take action. <laughs> So, more questions, comments in there. Great. And you, yes. Hello, thank you very much for being here. Um, I think in any field, in any career, we learn a lot from our mistakes and we get better with time. Um, could you talk about as one or more mistakes that you've done in the beginning and that you've learned a lot from? And a second part of the question would be, 
Um, to this day, are there still things about um, your work that um, give you a bit of pressure, even if you have a lot of experience every day when you go on set? Thank you. Great question for both of you. So, Anya's first and then Nancy. <laughs> so, the biggest mistake you really learned from when you were young and what's still differ difficult? Um. Uh, first time I was a focu uh, focus puller, so instead of things, we were doing a makeup test. And uh, <laughs> and when we saw the dailies, for one second, we could see a bright image and then the normal uh, density for the image. And Vim already understood what happened and we said, don't forget to stop down. <laughs> so. After this, I never <laughs> forget to stop down. Then another mistake for Beau Travail, first day of shooting, we had to leave the hotel at three in the night because it was like a four hours drive to, to go where we started to shoot. And we, we, we came back quite late the, the Sunday for, from a day of work because we decided to do some shots in the city. It was not planned before was done, you know, like uh, like that. And uh, somehow, uh, when I arrived there, where we start to shoot, we were supposed to start to shoot, I realized that I had forgotten my light meter. So I was without light meter. And of course, at that moment, no cell phone, nothing. And anyway, there was no way, no possible way to get it. So I almost had an heart attack. And, uh, <laughs> I thought, well, I have only one thing to do is to tell Claire that I don't have my light meter and uh, <laughs> that I will have to do without. And I came to see her and I said, oh, I forgot my light meter. And she said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, we, we filmed everywhere, inside, outside, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and then we took the train the train was late, that's why we shoot everywhere, four hours late, African <laughs> train coming from Addis Abeba. And then in the train, suddenly, you know, I was filming, 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 and suddenly I, I thought maybe I'm turned out to be crazy because I think it's so much faster to work without light meter. <laughs> <laughs> And then I thought, well, I will have to wait a few days before news from the lab. And uh, so I had one day, two days, three days. And then finally, I, I forgot, I had news five days later. And they said, no, no problem. <laughs> so it was like, uh, but you see, it's <laughs> so. Well. And then about mistake, there is another word also, there is accident. And accident, sometimes it's incredible. You have an accident, light accident, or you, the light is not uh, doing the, giving the result you were looking for. It's a mistake. But sometimes it's so much better than what you wanted to do. This is also something fantastic. Yeah, sometimes. accidental. Yeah. 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 And uh, in a way, that's also, um, it goes with improvisation, but it goes also with the idea of looking for unexpected things sometimes. It's, uh, uh, what I want to say with that is uh, you, you cannot uh, control every, everything. You cannot control everything. You may, may make mistake. But that's, that's the rule, that's normal, that's human. And when you, when you are beginning to feel more comfortable with that, to accept it, it's just a question, you, you feel much better, more free, somehow. And, and, you, and you find more things, I think. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> Um, 
I think I've tried to block out all my mistakes. <laughs> 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 um, what, I was on a documentary, uh, and I was the gaffer and the loader, um, and I flashed a roll of film, uh, and uh, I just remember having to go uh, tell the DP, and you know, I'd close the cover really quickly, but it was, you know, also, we were not in the U.S., and so I think it was in, uh, we were in Africa, and it was like, oh my God, you know. So, and you can't, you know, when you're on a documentary, you can't do a second take. So uh, there was edge fog, I mean, it was okay, but I just, you know, you only do that mistake once, you know. <laughs> and uh, also why I prefer not to be in the, you know, loader or, you know, I really never could pull focus, forget that. But, um, you know, to have two jobs was tricky. Um, and, uh, oh, well, I, this is one. It turned out not to be my problem, but um, I thought it was. Uh, when I was an electrician in New York, we didn't always have generators back in the day, and I would have to tie into the electrical boxes. And uh, so I was on this big shoot, and uh, all of a sudden, I'm tying in, and the lights go off. And we look outside, and the lights are off all <laughs> over the street. And I thought, oh my god. Well, as it turned out, the transformer had blown at the power plant, and it just was coincidental. But um, anyway, I was so emba embarrassed, because like, there were also no women on the crew in those days. You know, so, but um, basically, yeah. OK, so while, while uh, oh, do you have a uh, Yeah, I would like to add something, even though we are laughing today, it doesn't Every film still is the first film. Mm. Still. Mm. Yeah, that's all there is to say about it. Is it still difficult? Oh, no, not at all. It's a walk in the park. <laughs> it never is. <laughs> so we have one more question back there. So, uh, hi, I would like to ask you a more personal question, maybe. Uh, while working as a cinematographer, have you ever had, uh, let's say, a man in charge question your like credibility or, or abilities just because of your gender, and how did you respond? I don't think we would have been hired in the first place. Um, actually, you know something, at one time, um, I remember the producer had hired me, it was a foreign DP, uh, director coming in, I think he was French, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're sitting at the table and uh, the producer said, you know, Nancy Schreiber, the cinematographer, and he started laughing, saying, um, <clears throat> so I really felt like I had to prove myself. Yeah, he was French, but you wouldn't know him because he <laughs> didn't know. Um, but, you know, the hardest thing is getting in the room. And if you can get an interview, generally, you know, you can uh, hopefully prove yourself and you'll get hired. But um, television, there's people coming, you know, directors. I didn't, there was one time that I felt like I was not heard. And uh, I just had to, you know, do my work and, uh, you know, he was you know, an incoming director because in television the directors change every episode. Um, but uh, that it was rough, and I just really had to keep my voice in there and not shy away from it. But yeah. No, I was never hired, as you said. But um, I would do like you, what you said. I would keep on working, somehow pretending that I don't get the purpose, the, the issue, what, what's going on exactly. I would try to, to, to make believe that uh, I think it's a work problem, not a problem because of that. So, but what I can say is once I felt that it was, I was in preparation, and I felt that the, this uh, 
problem because I was a woman was so big in behind words and everything, I felt it. I felt it so strong that I, I just decided and I said, smiling, um, I said, um, I, I went away myself. I decided that it, it, was, uh, it was foolish to, to, to go there because it was like uh, to run into a wall. So uh, I decided not to, not to go through that because it would have been too, I think. But then otherwise it's, uh, it's true that you somehow many times you have a feeling that you, you, you must prove more. But um, go ahead as much as you can. <laughs> And after a little while, you are paid in return, I, I believe. I do believe in that. We have one here in second row. Hi, I was wondering if there is a difference between the representation of women in the American film industry and the European industry. Ooh, that's a good question. Anyone, any experts in the room on this? I want to say one thing which is related to this. Uh, being having been being from one of the Nordic countries where we have a lot of focus on uh, on gender diversity and even in some countries we have quotas for women in film and uh, and I believe sometimes we have kind of the positive problem sometimes uh, and actually not so rarely I have uh, women coming to me saying I don't really know if I got this job whether because I was a woman or because I was the right one. And, uh, and uh, it's kind of really something that can generate insecurity. Uh, I felt the same way myself, that sometimes when I was hired, I, I was thinking, I, I bet it's because I'm a woman, because now they need a woman, so I come in handy. And, uh, and I even joked about the fact, with, together with my sister, who is a theater director and a film director, that we always said that we will never apply as women. Then we will insist on applying as men, because we want to make sure we got it because we were the best. But actually, now I will just contradict myself and say that, in my opinion, don't give a shit as why you were elected. You got the job, you got the chance, take it and prove you're worth it. That's what it's about. You never know why. You never get to the bottom of why you got the job. There never is an, a simple solution. There can be a lot of, it's all messy. All opportunities are messy. There's not a pure, some once a female board member told me, I don't feel so write about it because I was the only one standing up for elections. Now, this is a, if this is a problem, everything is a problem. So just, if you get the chance, take it and believe you're worth it and prove it. So I know we have some more questions, but I want to uh, also on a cinematic level just update us, so because we have uh, a clip from a film that wasn't released yet and it's such an opportunity for us to see it, and Nancy, I, would you like to introduce it for us? Certainly, well, in and line... And we'll come back to the last question. Okay, uh, so this was a narrative about Robert Maplethorpe, the photographer, uh, woman director, Andy Timoner, she is a documentarian, well known uh, for having won Sundance Grand jury prize for documentaries twice. It's never happened. This was her first narrative. Um, we felt it was appropriate to shoot in celluloid. I hadn't shot film in years. 
And speaking of light meters, I kept forgetting, because we're so used to now you know, not using light meters as much, uh, I kept forgetting to pull mine out. Um, uh, a lab had just opened in New York City because we didn't have one there. There's only one left in Los Angeles, and there, was not, there weren't any in New York until this past spring, and Kodak opened it. Um, and we shot in Super 16. We really had to convince the producers that it was the right thing. We gave up a day, so I had 19 days. It was crazy, and uh, um, it was actually very freeing not to be tied to a monitor, and uh, I felt it was really fast, uh, the process, just because uh, I operated also. Because often what happens, well, in television in particular, and some movies, I can't always operate. I'm always doing two cameras in order to get the coverage because we have 15 days to shoot a movie or something ridiculous like that. Um, but um, I operated, and generally it was one camera. And as I said earlier, I had a total female crew uh, for camera. It was amazing. And um, so I'm just showing you a little clip. Uh, hopefully the film will be out sometime. There's a little... Uh, tension with the producers and the director. Uh, so it was supposed to be in Sundance and then it got pulled and they're recutting and I don't know what'll happen. So you guys, it's a secret that you're show, that I'm showing anything. And uh, in fact, uh, you'll see there's a little boy in walking in a church. It's not even in the movie anymore. And Andy, the director, was really happy. She said, the church lives because it was pulled by the producers for whatever reason. So a, let's here's a it. secret. We want more secrets, Nancy. <laughs> Fantastic. I think this is such a positive note. To, we're not quite finished, but I, we have time for one last question. But I just want to say that seeing this, knowing it's, uh, knowing it's a great story, we know the story, but, uh, but knowing how it was, uh, how it was filmed yeah. well, is really something. Again. It was 19 days in New York City, uh, but mostly in the boroughs because there's so much building. I mean, I see a lot of cranes here in the building, but there's New York is unrecognizable. And so um, we filmed the Chelsea Hotel where Robert lived with Patti Smith way out at, at this manor, and you'd look out the window and it was all green trees. It didn't look anything like Manhattan, but, you know, we, we may do. and. Uh, we just felt that Robert shot in film, and so it was appropriate to shoot in film, and we were just lucky that the lab was there, because if it hadn't been there, uh, and we would have had to ship to Los Angeles, and that w wouldn't have gone over. It was bad enough the producers were very tight with money. It's, it's a tough time to be doing indies. So it's crazy that uh, it seems like uh, the world is... Uh developing so fast and uh, and at one point we thought all the old stuff would disappear but it's not only Mabel Thorpe and uh, Patty Smith who's still with us but also even celluloid so uh, and and still we also have all the new technology and all the new media uh, and all the new women so we have we have one question there and uh, Maybe it will be the last question, but uh, let's see. <laughs> oh, somewhere up there. Up, up, up. Ah, it's, and we have someone up there. I'm so sorry, it's because the light is blinding. So the, we will have a microphone coming up there while we take the question on the floor. Sorry, guys. I wanted to thank you for the very inspiring dialogue. And I, my question is really simple. What projects are you currently preparing? So, okay, I am uh, doing a film, uh, I'm about to do a film in Los Angeles for a change uh, that takes place in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, it took place in about 2000, uh, uh, a mother in the poorer areas of Washington, D.C. 
um, advocated for getting better schooling for her kid um, and uh, got just a huge group of parents together and they marched, this is a true story. Uh, we are going to Washington for like four days because it's so impossible to find exteriors in Los Angeles. But the mother is played by Uzu, Uzo Aduba, which I can't pronounce it, from uh, Orange is the New Black. She plays Crazy Eyes, Suzanne. So we're very excited about that. And it's a tiny little movie. I think we have 20 days, maybe. We'll see. Uh, 16 in LA and then four in, uh, in um, DC. And uh, then I'm also doing, right before that, uh, I'll be supposedly color correcting Maplethorpe, but we'll see. <laughs> and yes. Um, for me, uh, nothing, because I have uh, finished uh, shooting very recently, and uh, I want to take a little bit time for my own work. So ah. <laughs> I allow myself a little uh, break. <laughs> we, we will look forward to that. So I will look up to Florian and, and ask him if it's okay to take a few last questions. Brief questions. So I'm so sorry, you guys up there, for not having uh, seen you before. So did we get a microphone upstairs? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? So please, yes. Yeah, I just want to say it's so beautiful to see um, two women uh, cinematographers on stage and how um, supportive you are of each other. Sorry, you can't see me, but I'm here. <laughs> and um, I wanted to ask you, have you, is your experience in the industry that women are mostly supportive of each other, or do you experience a lot of competition with other women in the field, and how, how do you suggest um, creating a collaborative versus competitive environment? You know, there are not so many women to compete with, so... <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, brief answers. Yeah. All right, uh, brief. Wow. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that I think the press... I mean, there's just this belief that we are competing with each other, and it's the most ridiculous belief. And uh, certainly, maybe because of the scarcity of work, it has been, you know, it's, you know, that's been the belief, you know, the scarcity of work for women in our industry. Um, but generally I'm finding a lot of camaraderie and sisterhood. Um, and uh, we'll see, again, there's just this gap in the larger budget movies, but hopefully with Patty Jenkins you know, and Wonder Woman and Rachel Morrison, shooting Black Panther and Mudbound and, you know, Reed Murano now uh, directing Handmaid's Tale. Um, things are opening up and uh, we have to just push and keep the doors open and loud voices. So it's just not a few and then there won't be competition. Okay. <laughs> So, so I think we will uh, go for the last question up there. Yeah. Second. Oh, we have uh, two more. Oh, but listen, I'm so sorry. We are over time, and we have so many hands. So uh, we have to take a brief, few brief ones up there, and I can't promise you all get. So okay, I I have the microphone, so I'm gonna ask my question. <laughs> Um, I, I got curious because you mentioned at the beginning, Nancy, that you started as a gaffer in New York and then you mentioned also that if you would have been in L.A. it might have been a different story. And I was just wondering, could you elaborate on that because I got curious. Well, mm. <laughs> it's a very unionized world in Hollywood. Uh, well, it was in New York as well. Um, the uh, IATSE, our union. Um, at the time I was in New York, there was another union. We were just one local made up of all the people that weren't the sons, generally, or daughters, of the members. And uh, it was a very political time in the 70s. And uh, so I came up in this other union, uh, and we got swallowed up by the IATSE eventually. Um, so, 
I just think that the obstacles were, would have been too great in Hollywood then. But I have many friends that are in Hollywood now. I mean, it's a different time. Uh, this movie I'm about to do, I have a woman key grip, which is, you know, fantastic. Uh, she's amazing. And, uh, you know, although my gaffer, the one I'm using, is a male, he's got a, a pink uh, hair and, you know, you know uh, and works with a lot of women electricians. <laughs> no, so diversity is happening, and it's just that that is a sign of that things are changing. Um, but uh, New York still has a better independent film scene, um, just like when I came up and... Uh, so it's still, I think, easier to break in in New York than in Los Angeles, my opinion. Thank you. Okay, so I'm so sorry. Uh, I just got information from out there that time is up. Time is up, and I know we could continue, and, uh, but uh, I'm so sorry. I'm sure that uh, if someone wants to approach the stage afterwards, there would be time for a few individual questions. So s thank you so much for taking your time, and thank you so much for taking your time to be here. Um, I just want to say, time's up is our motto, time's up. What did she say? I didn't ask you.